This webinar is dedicated to Dr. Noah Emmett Al Aluli. Dr. Aluli, as a founding member of Ahuina Kauka, also believed in the importance of research by engaging community to focus on better understanding factors outside of our physical health that impact health and wellness. He believed in the importance of connections to place, to Aina, and to each other. He also believed in the importance of mentorship and creating spaces to grow the next generation of Kauka. Ahoyana Kauka's mission is to champion healthcare for Native Hawaiians, reaches far beyond the shores of Hawaii. As a founding organization and member of PRIDOC, the Pacific Region's Indigenous Doctors Congress, we are able to network with fellow Indigenous doctors associations across the Pacific. Through PRIDOC, we can create spaces for Indigenous physicians, students, researchers, and health professionals from across the Pacific to gather around shared issues of well-being among the many Indigenous communities that we serve. It was at our last PRIDOC conference in Canada that we met our very special guest today. We're honored to introduce Dr. Jason Dean and Dr. Rhea Mokiao, and also very, very excited to have two Native Hawaiian medical students at Jabsum, Elliot and Vanessa here to help moderate our Q&A. Before I hand this off to Joanne to formally introduce our speakers, on behalf of Ahu Yonakauka, I want to extend a mahalo to the Hawaii Public Health Institute and the Community Engagement Corps of Ola Hawaii, a research program of the University of Hawaii Johnny Byrne School of Medicine for co-sponsoring this webinar. Mahalo. Mahalo, Marcus. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I wanna let you know that this webinar was really the brainchild of uh, Dr. Noah Emmett Aluli. And um, I came across something so fortuitously, it was, uh, abstract that he submitted to the Pride Out Conference, but over a decade ago, but it is such a fitting introduction. So I'm going to give you some excerpts from it. It was entitled, How and Why a Primary Care Physician Gets Involved in Cardiovascular Disease Research. So quote, historically, the issues in my life have been clear. They have all centered around social injustice. Hawaiians disenfranchised from their aina, their history, their cultural beliefs and practices, their medicines, ultimately their health and well-being. In one way or another, I have dealt with these injustices and directed my path as an activist, rural physician, and researcher to better understand the burden of cardiovascular disease in Kanaka Maoli. It has been a journey of challenging academic norms, learning and leveraging the power of community mobilization, and self-awareness and reflection on the multiple roles of an Indigenous physician in community health. We became researchers because there were problems that needed to be addressed. We broke a lot of rules. We logged a lot of lessons learned, which I feel privileged to share with my indigenous colleagues with the hope that it will add to the momentum and belief that physicians need to be more than health practitioners if we are to correct the injustices that impair the health and well-being of the peoples and communities we serve." Unquote. So I thought, oh my gosh, written over a decade ago, and yet his sentiments are perfect for today's webinar. So it is my honor to introduce our speakers who Emmett brought into our circle to share and help us learn. So first up on the agenda will be Dr. Jason Dean, who is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine, Cardiology, and Vice Chair for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion in the Department of Pediatrics. He is 2023 School of Medicine recipient of the Martin Luther King Community Service Award from the University of Washington Medicine Department. Dr. Dean is a pediatric cardiologist and director of the University of Washington School of Medicine Indian Health Pathway Initiative. Joining Dr. Dean is Dr. Rael Mokiao, who is a Native Hawaiian Samoan pediatric nephrologist at the University of Washington and the Seattle Children's Hospital. She is currently an acting assistant professor at Seattle Children's Research Institute, and her research focuses on understanding the disproportionate burden of kidney disease in indigenous populations by identifying kidney disease risk factors, including adverse social determinants of health, protective influences, and markers of subclinical kidney disease in indigenous youth. So, 
we're in store for a great session. And I'm excited to have you both join us. And I'm gonna hand it over to you, Dr. Dean. Uh, so, Kinexikoa, Nutanico, Dr. Jason Dean. So, hello, relatives. My name's uh, Jason. Um, so, I'm Blackfeet, and it's it's really my honor to be here uh, with you all today. You know, Dr. Luli was um, such an important role model and mentor to many Native physicians um, and many Native physicians here um, on the mainland. So, it's 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 wonderful to to um, you know hold um, a candle and continue his his legacy. So, so um, Dr. Moki and myself are going to talk about the strong heart study um, today. Um, and we're going to talk a bit about uh, just a little bit of, of background on um, what's known about epidemiology of cardiovascular disease in American Indians. Um, we're going to overview the strong heart study itself and um, go into the details of, of, of what we collect and, and when we've collected it. Um, this uh, section will be lessons learned um, and we'll kind of highlight some of the, the major publications and things uh, that have come out of the Strong Heart um, study. Um, there's been about uh, 470 papers that have been published from our data. We'll talk about next steps because Dr. Moki and I are both Moki and I, and I are both pediatricians. So we'll talk a little bit about how this can um, um, these data can be trans uh, can be applied to um, younger folks. Uh, we'll talk about some opportunities that that you all as um, health professionals can um, interface with Strongheart, and then we'll um, talk about the relevance to. Um, not only other indigenous groups, but indigenous uh, groups in, in, in Hawaii and the Pacific Islands. Right. So um, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of deaths for uh, American Indians. It wasn't always known to be the case, um, but in the 70s, um, Indian Health Service physicians on the mainland we're just noticing that there was a higher prevalence of obesity, that there was a high, pre high prevalence of diabetes, and as such, they were seeing um, incident cardiovascular disease. So um, the Indian Health Service physicians really tasks, tasked the, in, the um, National Institute of Health uh, to study this. So, um, so what we do know um, from some other data is that mortality for American Indians is really higher um, uh, than the general population in regards to cardiovascular disease. So it's a leading cause of death. Mortality is higher. And actually, American Indians die er at earlier ages. Um, so 36% of American Indians die of cardiovascular disease before the age of 65. And this is compared to about 14% uh, of Caucasians. As I kind of mentioned, uh, the reasons for this are multifactorial, really um, grounded in the social determinants of health which again are defined by uh, systemic racism and structural racism. But um, as a consequence of that structural racism, diabetes and, and obesity prevalence in um, native communities on the mainland is, is high. So um, the Strong Heart study was uh, started in 1988. And I'll go through a little um, bit of background about it. Um, the basic aims um, for our study um, were to quantify prevalent cardiovascular disease um, and its risk factors. We wanted to quantify incident events as well. And we, we defined uh, cardiovascular events as, um, as myocardial infarction, stroke, um, rhythm things, and heart failure. We... Um, in later studies, wanted to evaluate preclinical cardiovascular disease because, again, um, American Indians have premature cardiovascular disease. And then we wanted to identi identify per, uh, potentially some genetic determinants. So we did, in our fifth phase, um, open the study up to uh, family units. Um, these are our, our communities. I'm going to go back. These are our communities. So we have 13 tribal communities that partner with us. Um, and we really couldn't do this study without them. Um, we let them drive our um, our uh, study questions in a large part. We consider all of our uh, strong heart participants as 
as co-investigators. But there are communities throughout North and South Dakota and the Oklahomas and in and, and, and Arizona as well. So again, 13 tribal communities um, are our are co-PIs. So, um, so there's been basically two American Indian cohorts. You, you can think of the Strongheart study as kind of like the native Framingham. Those of you who've um, gone to you know public health school or medical school uh, know about the Framingham study. But what we know is that when the Framingham risks risk um, calculator is applied to a multiracial cohort, it doesn't work very well. Um, so thankfully, there are there are uh, um, studies like Strongheart, um, but like like the Framingham, there's been a couple of generations of cohorts in Strongheart. So the original cohort was comprised of over 4,500 participants. These were 45 years old to 74 years old. Most were female. And again, this this first um, cohort was um, the, and Strongheart begun in uh, 1988. Um, then about 10 years later, um, we um, collected the family cohort, um, and this was the fifth phase of Strongheart, um, and we labeled this the Strongheart Family Study. So there were over 3,600 um, uh, participants uh, within 94 family units. Um, the, we collected data on much younger patients um, uh, down to 14 years to 94 years old. And again, most were female, and this was again uh, started in, in 1998. And the goal of this extended study was to uh, include family members and really add the identification of genetic risk factors for cardiovascular disease, as well as look at um, uh, preclinical disease in, in adolescents. So this is the timeline that we've so um, that we have followed. Um, there is currently there's been there have been six examinations which have been completed. Um, if you want to think of the first three exams as the original Strongheart, and we have adjudicated um, uh, data from um, exams. Um, that uh, occurred in um, 89 to 91, 93 to 95, and then 98 to 99. Again, we expanded the cohort to include uh, the 94 family units as well as adolescents. So um, those exams occurred from 2001 to 2003 and um, 2006 to 2009. And then in phase six, um, all the surviving original and, and strong heart family uh, study participants were um, examined again. So we're currently in our seventh phase, and we'll talk a little bit about um, our, ex our examination that's actually going on right now. So um, as I kind of mentioned, there's three field centers, and these organize local um, tribal communities. Um, so I'm the co-PI of the, of the Arizona Data Collection Center, and this is organized by the MedStar Health Research Institute, which is um, which is at Georgetown University. The University of Oklahoma in, in Oklahoma um, organizes that center. And then Missouri Breaks um, Industries Research Incorporated um, organizes the, the Dakota um, uh, data collection site. We do have a central lab and repository when we do um, um, obtain samples from our co, um, our relatives, our, 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 our co-investigators. Um, these are um, stored in a, a minus 40 freezer um, at Georgetown. We do have a cardiology center that really stores all of the um, uh, cardiac imaging that we obtain, um, such as echocardiography or a carotid ultrasound. And then there's a genetic center, which is centered at Texas Biomed Research Institute. So um, we also have a strong heart steering committee. Um, as I mentioned, um, you know, we, what, what we practice is, um, you know, we, we, we practice community-based participatory research before really that was a term, uh, to be honest with you. And this is, I think that um, the general uh, medical population can learn a lot from indigenous doctors and indigenous researchers because um, as as we as indigenous people, we all know that community health really trumps individual health. Um, so um, so we really rely on our steering committee um, to not only set agenda for our research, um, but also um, hold our feet to the fire and make sure that we're doing uh, the right thing for 
for our communities. So our steering committee really includes Native researchers, but more importantly, tribal and community members. Um, again, all, all of us are considered investigators um, on uh, the project um, uh, and the projects um, to be planned. There are several subcommittees. Um, it's um, There's a coordinator's subcommittee, a uh, community advisory uh, a group, a CAG, um, again, and they help us set much of the agenda, um, given that we um, have this uh, focus on, on um, the community. Um, there's a morbidity and mortality adjudication subcommittee. There are publications and presentations. There's an administrative subcommittee, operations, ethics, quality control. Um, we also offer ancillary study, the opportunities to do ancillary studies. While while we at Strongheart um, have been tasked by the by NAH to um, to look at um, a certain uh, a certain amount of data, um, if other researchers would would like to piggyback onto um, uh, some of our exam days, they can apply for ancillary st studies. The most important of these was called Strongheart Stroke where um, they looked at um, neurovascular and neurocognitive um, data um, on our patients. So I will say that um, as part of, as part of as part of this back and forth between us as as the researchers and, and our communities, we really um, we really respect uh, tribal sovereignty in regards to the data. In regards to what we find out, um, there are multiple steps along the way that we employ to ensure that we are accountable to them. So, for instance, um, before any of our data is um, abstracted or presented at a national meeting or written up in a manuscript, we need to supp supply the tribes with um, a lay summary of what um, our goals were with the, with the specific project, what um, our findings are, and then how those findings would be beneficial to to our tribal partners and co investigators and our relatives. So, um, so there's again there's this there's this constant back and forth that um, that is important um, for us as indigenous as as indigenous people. So I'll, I'll shift a little bit um, to some of the lessons learned. Again, um, most of what we know about cardiovascular disease and its risk factors in American Indians really came from strong heart. Um, so what this shows is that the prevalence of atherosclerotic plaque or hardening of the arteries, which leads to both heart attack and stroke, is much higher in the strong heart study, which is the light blue line compared to the Eric study which um, was about two thirds uh, Caucasian and one third uh, black and African-American. And this held true for all uh, different groups, even very young folks in their forties and fifties. Um, incident coronary heart disease was also um, increased in our populations and that's seen in this black bar of our strong heart participants. And again, this was the original cohort compared to the ERIC study and, that I just described. Incident congestive heart failure was also increased for strong heart um, compared to uh, Caucasians as well as black and African-American um, patients. And then stroke um, was also elevated at, at every age group um, in the strong heart um, cohort. Um, so the the most um, applicable uh, finding for the for not only native people and indigenous people in general, but for um, the wider medical community as a whole. Was the was that Strongheart was the first study that um, proved that that diabetes mellitus type two was a coronary heart disease equivalent, um, and you can see here the first set of bars is men, the second set of bars, um, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. The first set of bars is women, the second set of bars is men, um, and, and you can see that um, the prevalence of diabetes um, mellitus and just glucose intolerance was quite high in our populations, more in Arizona than the others, but, you know, 60% or, or more in general. 
And what we found was that most cardiovascular disease occurred in those diabetic patients. So again, this this was not this was not known before uh, these data came out in 1996. So again, that's that's probably the the um, the most important finding um, from strong heart. Um, so diabetes was found as a strong independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease, while um, obesity and insulin resistance in general was not, though it was it was um, discussed that obesity and insulin resistance were along the um, pathogenic pathway to diabetes mellitus, which again raised the risk of cardiovascular disease in American Indians greatly. Um, and then uh, it, it was also uh, found that risk factor clustering was uh, particularly uh, predictive of cardiovascular disease. So in this um, in this graph, if you had um, prehypertension, your um, cumulative incidence was 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 lower than if you had diabetes, and then lower um, still um, if you had. Um, the highest combination of uh, pre pre -hyper, um, pre hypertension and diabetes. Um, microvascular disease, um, so uh, renal disease um, associated with diabetes, um, also predicted cardiovascular disease mortality. So this was measured by albuminuria or protein in the urine again as a marker for microvascular disease. And then left ventricular hypertrophy by echocardiogram also predicted cardiovascular disease mortality. Um, so these shook out as the unique cardiovascular disease risk factors that, um, that were uh, seen in American Indians. So again, um, we just uh, learned that albuminuria really predicted car uh, cardiovascular disease and, and um, this as a marker of uh, diabetic nephropathy or microvascular disease. Um, that left ventricular hypertrophy, as measured by echocardiogram, also was uh, predictive of cardiovascular disease in American Indians. Elevated fibrinogen as an acute phase reactant also predicted cardiovascular disease. And I think it's because of the central obesity that's common in some of our um, in some of our communities. And then as a correlate for for left ventricular hypertrophy by echocardiogram, because again, echocardiogram isn't widely available um, at some of our um, urban Indian, our Indian Health Service, or our tribal clinics. Um, prolonged cure restoration as a correlate of LVH um, was proven to be um, predictive of cardiovascular disease um, in American Indian women. So we've, um, remember I kind of mentioned that the framing, things like the Framingham Risk Calculator, the ATP3 uh, risk calculator really are probably not the best um, at predicting cardiovascular disease in our populations. And this was uh, proven in several studies in JAMA. So we uh, took all these data and we, um, we uh, developed clinical um, tools for this. So the first was a coronary heart disease risk calculator. And again, this, this mirrors the Framingham coronary heart disease risk calculator. So this was an American Indian specific and sex stratified coronary heart disease risk calculator. And it was designed for uh, patients that were over 30 years of age. Because remember that um, cardiovascular disease is um, not only more deadly in American Indians, but it's um, it leads to premature cardiovascular disease. So it affects younger, pa younger patients. And this, like Framingham, really um, estimated the 10-year risk of developing uh, diabetes. Um, and it's kind of a plug and play model. I would say that this this may be applicable to your your communities, given um, the that um, Native Hawaiians and uh, American Indians really share some of the same social de social determinants and share the same um, higher prevalence of of diabetes mellitus. But again, it's kind of a, a plug and play model. Um, it's on our website. Um, I think this is an old um, this is an old. Um, uh, at a website address. It's it's strongheartstudy.org currently, but you you um you you put in your uh, dyslipidemia strategy, uh, the person's gender, uh, the person's age, if they're taking any anti 
hypertensive medications, what their blood pressure is, what their cholesterol is, if they have diabetes, if they're smokers. And then the most, more importantly, you know, do they have a certain amount of protein in their urine? So, um, so a little bit different from Framingham where you would just uh, correct these things for indigenous patients. I would counsel you to also collect urine um, to help out with your cardiovascular disease uh, prediction. There was also a diabetes risk calculator. And again, American Indian specific tool um, developed using strong heart data designed for young indigenous folks and it estimated the four-year risk of developing diabetes. So uh, very, very similar, um, very similar uh, layout to the coronary heart disease risk calculator. And there's also a hypertension uh, risk calculator as well. And again, if you go to our website and there's a tab for, and I'll show you the website at the end, but there's a tab for uh, clinicians and all of our risk calculators are on that website. So if someone is, is um, very app savvy, please get in contact with me. Um, so, um, so the, 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 the information that we collected from Strongheart really were, they eventually made their way into the medical record, whether it's, um, you know, on, on the mainland, American Indians really get their, the majority of American Indians really get their, um, healthcare from a three-part system, whether it's an urban Indian, um, healthcare system. And we have one of those clinics here in Seattle. Um, called the Seattle Indian Health Board, whether it's the federal system uh, housed within the Indian Health Service, or whether it's a tribal, tribally funded or so-called tribal 638 clinic. Um, all the results of our examinations, our adjudication from those exams, um, and this includes a wide variety of, of diagnostic tests, including MRI, echo, um, ultrasound measures, serologies, um, these were all these all made their way eventually back to the medical record. Um, and the Indian Health Service really used these to develop their own specific guidelines for for prevention of heart disease and stroke. Um, so we're we're quite proud that we um, were able to contribute um, to those sorts of guidelines. And then again, there were the um, prediction equations that I um, that I just mentioned. So, um, so th this was a, re a more recent paper, um, and thankfully, using the lessons learned from Strongheart, using our clinical tools, using our um, data to develop guidelines, incident cardiovascular disease really has declined more recently for American Indians um, in the Strongheart study. Mortality or death from cardiovascular disease declined more for men while the prevalence of disease declined uh, for women. Um, and this was a paper from a few years ago. All right. So I don't think Dr. Mokia or I could talk, um, give a talk without mentioning um, children. Um, so I did wanna mention that, um, that, the, that this is probably, um, a future direction for uh, the strong heart study, because um, what we really need to do is is you know for all indigenous people, um, we know that that our uh, next generation is really um, you know the ones that we that we need to focus on and and protect. So um, remember, I said that cardiovascular disease is premature in American Indians um, and likely in all indigenous populations. So we need to figure out when is the best time to screen for some of these things. And what we would be screening for is not overt cardiovascular disease, not heart attack, not stroke, not um, hypertension, those sorts of things. But we, what we wanna do is look at subclinical or, or non-symptomatic um, cardiovascular disease, pathologic changes, to the cardiovascular system um, that is present um, in younger um, indigenous patients. And what we know is, is if we find these changes, and I'll go through what those changes are in a second, if we find those changes, these are really the pathologic precursors for adult onset um, cardiovascular disease. Um, these have been shown for a long period of time, not only um, hinted at in strong heart, but have been known since the you know late 80s, early early 90s in studies like the Bogalusa Heart Study or the Pathologic Determinants of Atherosclerosis in Youth, the PDA study. 
uh, that um, these pathologic changes that are found in children are independent risk factors for adult cardiovascular disease and adult, adult cardiovascular disease uh, mortality. So how does this work? Um, we have known risk factors that we usually associate with older folks, but um, unfortunately are becoming uh, more common, commonly found in our children. So these include obesity is probably the main um, uh, uh, thing that starts this pathologic cascade. Uh, this leads to hypertension. This leads to dyslipidemia. This leads to um, insulin resistance. Um, once that cluster of traditional cardiovascular risk factors is present, so that's called the metabolic syndrome, um, this leads to um, pathologic changes in the cardiovascular system that don't cause symptoms. So they may lead to um, uh, increased thickness of the heart, so left ventricular hypertrophy. It may lead to early um, uh, blood vessel changes or atherosclerosis. Again, um, there are um, uh, pathologic changes that happen on a very minute level that will accumulate over time. Um, they may have uh, kidney dysfunction, um, as evidenced by um, uh, protein in the urine. Um, if that is left unchecked, na unchecked naturally, um, that may uh, persist to um, more formal disease that we um, usually associate with adults, such as myocardial infarction or heart attack, um, stroke, um, and unfortunately death. So um, subclinical cardiovascular disease really can be diagnosed by non-invasive imaging, usually ultrasound um, of the heart or large arteries. So what we've looked at in Strongheart is the carotid artery medial thickness. We've looked at left atrial volume. We've looked at left ventricular hypertrophy or heart thick, increased heart thickness. And we've looked at various uh, parameters for uh, ventricular function, both the squeezing or the systolic function and the relaxing or the filling. Uh, function. That's the diastolic function. And what we know is that children and adolescents with known cardiovascular risk factors, uh, most importantly, obesity and diabetes are more likely to have these cardiovascular abnormalities um, that I listed there. So on the left side of your screen, uh, that's a growth, gross uh, pathology specimen um, of left ventricular hypertrophy or heart thickness. You can see here, this is the circular left ventricle and the right ventricle kind of wraps around it. To a cardiologist size, we look at these through ultrasounds and, and on, the, on the, I'm sorry, the right side of your screen now, um, this is a depiction of this with the um, left ventricle here and here. Again, circular uh, pumping chamber and the right ventricle anteriorly, which wraps around uh, the left ventricle. So this is kind of what it looks like to a cardiologist. Um, so I'll review some of the data from the strong heart family study. So again, the, the, a, a lot of the most important papers that came out of this study, including Dr. Mokiao's study, um, really was centered around our 400 and about 450 American Indian adolescents. Uh, these were aged um, about 14 to 20 years old. And what we know from, um, from some prevalent studies that about a quarter of American Indian uh, youth in the strong heart family study had metabolic syndrome or that cluster of risk factors defined as obesity, um, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, pre-diabetes. Um, and what we know is those who had this risk factor clustering really had differences in the way their hearts looked when we looked at them um, with ultrasound. So left atrial diameter um, or left collecting chamber size was, um, was increased in um, American Indian patients with overnutrition or, or uh, those who are overweight or obese. The heart thickness itself was very different between uh, American Indian um, youth who had normal weight versus overnutrition, so overweight and obesity. Um, the ejection fraction or the measure of systolic squeezing function um, was also different for, um, for uh, American Indian youth who had overnutrition uh, compared to those who had normal weight. 
Um, so this is uh, more of more of that data, but you know, um, individuals with the metabolic syndrome really have abnormalities in left atrial dilation, which is a correlate of um, of uh, diastolic dysfunction or, or heart stiffness. In these children, they had um, abnormalities in heart thickness, and they had uh, more squeezing and filling uh, dysfunction. Um, this was a recent study, um, and it looked at um, subclinal ath atherosclerosis or um, hardening of the arteries in uh, young uh, patients in the strong heart family study. And it was it was shown that um, that um, that more of our uh, more of those patients with risk factor clustering had hardening of the arteries at that time. So, so all 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 very concern all very concerning findings. But it seems like. Um, Maybe adolescence, even 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 adolescence, maybe we're catching things a little bit too late, because what we've what we've what we've shown is that, um, you know, a quarter of those kids have these cardiovascular disease risk factor clusters, and therefore a quarter of them are are already on their way to having um, adult type um, cardiovascular disease. So really, should should we be should we be assessing um, younger and younger uh, native patients? So currently we're we're in our fourth phase. Um, this was started a couple of years ago. Um, it was put on a little bit of a hold because of um, the pandemic, but we were funded for seven years. Um, we anticipate that we will collect um, uh, data on about 3,500 participants. And again, these are survivors of the original cohort, as well as um, those in the Strong Heart Family Study. Um, we're currently doing examinations. They did start um, this year, um, so we had to um, delay it for one year. Um, but we basically will, um, these consist of, of recruitment. Um, and again, the, the one of the strengths of the Strong Heart Study is that, um, and you know how Native communities are, um, are, are um, our high retention rate. Um, one thing that has helped us with recruitment, uh, for our study is that not only do we, do we, um, do we rely on our communities to, um, you know, partner with us on the study to help us, well, sorry, help us set our agenda, but we also, um, train community members to help us with the study itself. So we've trained several of our community members to be uh, nurses, uh, research technicians, phlebotomists, um, sonographers. So, um, so a lot of times, if we're looking for someone, we can just you know, you know, call one of the nurses and say, "Hey, you need to call your you need to call your cousin to come back in for their exam." So, um, so you know, um, definitely a, a, a different form of native native HIPAA there, but. Um, but, um, but so, so it consists of recruitment, informed consent, um, blood pressure and other, um, uh, uh other, uh, body measurements, uh, there's phlebotomy and, and, and urine, uh, collected, um, and these samples are all, um, stored for future use and then questionnaires to update their personal medical history and current medications. So again, there there are multiple training opportunities um, for you um, to partner with us. Not only if you are a biomedical researcher or a clinician who is interested in research, and I and I do take Dr. Aluli's um, uh, uh, abstract from ten years ago to heart, because um, you know I, I'm I'm the only cardiologist involved in the study, and and um, most of my uh, co PIs and partners. Um, they are primary care physicians. So, so there's really a role for all different clinicians to uh, do this, the, uh, this sort of study. Um, we also, because we want to train the next generation, we also target um, uh, uh, different levels of learners. Um, and we have approached um, high school students, college students, uh, various uh, graduate level students, uh, postdoctoral students, and then professional students, MDs, um, have partnered with us to um, do secondary day analyses, learn about CBPR methods, um, do site visits, and those sorts of things. 
Again, our participants are our most important co-investigators for this work, um, and we really uh, rely on them um, and, again, encourage them to be um, uh, par partners with us. And as I mentioned, community members, we, we have trained um, and uh, fostered their, their own um, health professional and research careers. Uh, there are several online tutorials and, and sessions that all of you are uh, welcome to interface with us um, about. Um, some of the topics are biostats and epidemiology, uh, genetic research, particularly in regards to approaching um, indigenous populations uh, and genetic research. As you all know, that's a very sensitive uh, topic with a lot of indigenous populations with um, the uh, misuse of our data that was collected by uh, non-Indigenous researchers in the, in the past, not too distant past, I will add. Um, we um, provide uh, guidance on how to um, analyze publicly available health data or so-called secondary data analyses. Um, we talk about qualitative data research methods. Um, and again, all of this is through an Indigenous, uh, an indigenous lens. So this is our website. Um, it's again, you can see it up here, strongheartstudy.org. Um, there are several tabs, whether you're a researcher, whether you're interested in education, whether you are a, a primary care physician caring for an indigenous patient, whether you want to um, learn more about engaging in community. Uh, there are several tabs through here and you can learn a lot more. So please, um, please get in contact with us. One of the things that say you are a medical student or you are a resident and you want to um, interface with um, Strongheart, we will definitely um, um, help you get um, uh, funded uh, in this regard. Um, we usually work through what's called um, you know, a funding mechanism called the NIH Diversity Supplement. And we've used that diversity supplement to support indigenous researchers um, and uh, training of indigenous researchers. So not only American Indians, but also Alaska Natives, also Native Hawaiians, also Pacific Islanders. So, um, And this is through a variety of different things. Um, researchers have gained experience in, in our field centers, in our coordinating centers, in community engagement, in our genetics, in our um, uh, labs, and in our, um, our hard uh, cardiovascular science. Um, we also train in human subjects research and um, we train those to organize and help other researchers conduct research. We uh, give training and internships in data um, entry, data cleaning and data management, and project management in general, and community event coordination. Because again, a lot of what we do um, is not only hard science, like I kind of alluded to, but it's it's really kind of showing up with these communities and and you know messing around with the kids and um, talking to the elders and, and those sorts of things. Uh, for instance, I um, about a month and a half ago, I did a strong heart trip down to Arizona and I did no, I did no hard science. I did I wrote um, I did not write a single line um, of text. But what I did was, you know, I played games with the kids. Um, we had a, a couple community events. Um, I interacted with elders. I brought them food, uh, we ate together, we laughed together. And that um, definitely was, um, I think, more important than than some of the science that we do. Um, there are, again, for our papers and ancillary studies, they, they need to go through tribal and community review. Uh, we, um, we think that this is a very important part of what we do. Um, again, there are secondary data analyses of, of existing data. Remember, we have adjudicated data going back 33 years um, with new data coming in every day. So those of you who are, um, are interested in uh, partnering with us, whether it's um, you are a um, early learner wanting to get into research, you're a medical student uh, wanting to do more research, if you're a resident interested in uh, going into um, a, a subspecialty fellowship, um, we can help you with papers, presentations. We've partnered with several folks through their professional um, classes to uh, complete theses and dissertations. Um, if you're if you're an established researcher and you want to help and you want to partner with us to collect your own data using Strongheart participants, we can um, we can guide you through ancillary studies or or um, sub studies. 
so again this is our this is our website and that's the easiest way um, to get a hold of us um again there there are mul there are multiple networking opportunities as well um, summer research experiences um, interactions through professional organizations like the Native American Research Centers for Health, the Association of American Indian Physicians, and we partner with a, a, a lot of different health institutions, so we could potentially partner with your um, universities in Hawaii. Um, so nice. yeah, so, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Is, this your, is this your part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, maybe I should have put a like distinguishing slide in between. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was, I was thinking, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know. What to this one. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Jason. That was that was really great. Um, and now I'm just gonna finish up our talk. Um, talking about my experience working with the Strong Heart study, and then also um touch on the relevance um to Kanaka Mali. So um the Strong Heart study, I think, is quite remarkable. Um, it is a very rich resource of information, like Jason was going through. Um, and the data is robust, it's comprehensive, and they used validated measures. So all of that is like very appealing to folks like myself who are interested in um, research and indigenous population health. And so um, myself and many other researchers before um, have done secondary data analyses um, of strong heart data from previous phases. And so that's my experience so far is with the secondary data analyses part, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, there is an approval process, um, like Jason mentioned, and I'll talk um, in more depth about that on the next slide. Um, but in terms of the data, so once your project is approved, um, it takes about two to four weeks um, for you to receive the data um, from the time you request it. And you receive the data through the um, Data Coordinating Center. And the folks there are so helpful. Um, they're very responsive and they're also very patient. And so if you're someone like me who um, forgets some variables here and there to request um, initially, they are very patient and will you know, do the best they can to get those variables to you quickly. Also, um, the data, you can request it to be in whatever format is accessible to you um, and whatever um, format you, um, whatever statistical software that you use. And so um, that's really convenient. And then once you receive the data, the data itself is like quite clean um, and very easy to work with. Um, and so as soon as you get the data, you can start analyzing it. Um, and the way that they've structured it um, is um, quite easy to understand. So um, overall, really good um, experience working with the data coordinating center and with the data itself. Um, and then oh, the other thing was that through the Strong Heart study, um, there are biostatisticians available for statistical help. And so, um, but I would strongly recommend that if you are interested in working with Strong Heart, um, to have your own um, statistical background, or if you don't, that's okay. But I would recommend you work with somebody, maybe not in Strong Heart, that has um, statistical background or that is a biostatistician, only because the biostatisticians with um, Strong Heart, they're great, um, but they are very busy people. Um, but that being said, if you have any questions or you need help with anything, they will. Um, you know, respond to you and set up meetings with you. So for example, I had some questions about my um, projects, um, my analysis plan, my models. And so I actually reached out to one of the biostatisticians and we met like two or three times over Zoom to go over all of those things and the nitty gritty details, just to make sure that I was thinking about things appropriately and was on the right track with my analysis in the way that I was thinking. And so I found that extremely helpful, especially from people that are very familiar with um, strong heart data. So that is available, but it does help if you have your own um, statistical background, or if not, that you have, um, that you can work with somebody that does. 
Oh, you can go to the next slide now, Jason. Thanks. <clears throat> now, talking more about like the approval process, like Jason mentioned. Um, and so this is related to the secondary data analyses. I have not done any ancillary studies or sub-studies um, with Strongheart, um, but there are um, clear guidelines and a format on the Strongheart study website for folks that are interested in either doing a thesis and or a manuscript. Um, and you have to do a thesis or manuscript proposal. And it's um, quite straightforward. It's like an introduction or background, um, your methods, your general analysis plan, and then a list of variables that you plan on using. And once you, um, you know, create your proposal and you submit it online um, through the Strong Heart website, it takes about a month for um, the Publications and Presentations Committee to review and approve your proposal. Once your proposal is approved and you'll get notified via email whether it was approved or not, um, but once it's approved, it takes about, um, then you have to, you know, submit your data request to the data coordinating center and you have to fill out that data distribution form. Um, and um, it takes about two to four weeks from that, from once they receive it for you to get your data. And once you get your data, you, uh, and you find your results um, and you want to present your results to the world, either through abstracts um, and or posters, or publish a manuscript that needs approval. And so your completed work or your abstract, um, you need to send that to the centers like Jason mentioned, so Dakota, Oklahoma, and the Arizona centers. And in addition to the work that you need approved, you also need to submit a lay summary, which is just a brief description of your research, the results, um, and then also how it's applicable to the communities. Um, and in an easily digestible language um, to share with everybody. And so once you send the lay summary and your work to the centers, that gets distributed to the um, IHS IRBs and also the tribes. And for abstracts, it takes about like one to two months for the abstract to be approved. Um, for manuscripts, it takes about two to three, um, sometimes even longer than that, like four months. Um, for your manuscript to go through all the approval processes. And I say all of this um, about this approval process. Um, it's necessary, it is appropriate, but just be aware that it does take some time. So just make sure you factor this into your project timeline. Um, yeah, next. Okay. Um, and so now I'm gonna talk about how I found the Strong Heart Study to be relevant um, to me um, as a Kanaka. So American Indians and Kanaka have you know, unique languages, beliefs, cultures, but we do share um, some similar experiences as indigenous people. Um, indigenous we use as an umbrella term um, to really reflect a population of people that have um, free, a colonial society. They have we typically have a strong link to land and resources, and then also distinct social, economic, and political systems. Um, indigenous people like American Indians and Kanaka Maoli often lack um, political representation, um, political participation, often experience um, economic marginalization, um, discrimination, and lack to access of social services. And these commonalities um, Jason alluded to before also stem from structural racism, overtly racist policies um, due to the effects of, or and the effects of colonization. And so all of these really have given rise to um, the social determinants of health. Um, and many of us um, indigenous folks share um, similar social determinants of health because of this. Um, and based on our shared social context, uh, we also share um, similar health inequities, just given the um, close interplay and um, relationship between um, one social determinants and health. Next slide, Jason. <clears throat> and so again, because of this shared social context and shared um, 
health inequities, there is a lot that we can learn from each other um, and also extrapolate um, in terms of research methods and also um, results. Um, Native Hawaiians are not strangers to longitudinal studies um, and research in general, especially in Hawaii. Um, but here are some reasons why I think that the Strong Heart Study um, is a successful longitudinal study of American Indians. Um, Jason mentioned the organization and the oversight um, by Native people, um, and also the fact that um, there are a lot of Indigenous researchers and then opportunities for training um, Indigenous um, members and, and research team members as well. And those things make it strong, but also I think the, the most important um, aspect is this continued community engagement piece. And um, results from the Strong Heart Study have you know, resulted in the creation of these risk calculators that Jason mentioned. Um, it's also results from the study have provided evidence for funding um, and have also provided evidence for interventions um, that directly benefit the community. And so I think the strong relationship between the Strong Heart Study and the communities themselves really serve as um, a model for not just indigenous research, but for all research. Um, and so that's how I um, think about um, the Strong Heart Study and its, rele its relevance to me and us. Um, so thanks, Dr. Mukio. So um, really, we want to um, thank all of the Strong Heart Study participants, because really without them, we wouldn't, um, be, you know, be able to do this work. Um, and we wouldn't be able to do this work about without the support of um, our, um, you know, participating communities. Um, you know, 30 years of our research and findings really wouldn't have been possible without without them. So. Right. Well, um, I we, we want to say thank you, or in my language, Nita Nitaki. Thank you all, relatives, for um, attending, and we look forward to um, addressing some of your questions. These are our emails. Um, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dean and Dr. Mokia. That was awesome. Um, I do want to share, I think I, I may have shared this with you before, but uh, back in the, when was it, early 2000s, uh, one of the research committee, committee members on Emmett's research team on Molokai literally read the Strong Heart proposal from cover to cover because we were looking for relevant ideas and models as we were trying to design the Native Hawaiian healthcare system for that island. So uh, I did mention to Auntie Jane that finally going to face to face, well, face to Zoom, <laughs> um, <laughs> with some of the Strong Heart fellows. So she uh, sends her aloha. But I want to thank you for uh, your presentations. And I'm going to turn this last part of the session over to our two medical students from JABSOM, uh, Vanessa Freitas and Elliot Markell. They grace, gracefully were voluntold to help to get the question and answers and, and that section going. So Vanessa, Elliot. Okay, I would just like to begin again by saying thank you very much to Dr. Dina, Dr. Mukiel for attending uh, this webinar. Um, we're going to actually start off with uh, Dr. Mao's question as she has her hands raised. Um, and Dr. Mao, if you would like to unmute or type your question. In. Hello, everybody. Um, hi, Jason. We met uh, at Pridoc in Canada. Yeah. And Emmett <clears throat> didn't know that we actually were on the same panel. And he dutifully introduced me to you a second time. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yes, of course. And and you always, and I did always say, a gracious person. So. Yeah, yeah, always a gracious host. Um, we missed him a lot. Yes. Um. Anyway, I want to say aloha to Rhea. I don't think I know you or met you. Um. I wanted to put 
into, I went to Mahalo you for the talk actually. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted to um, invite Rhea to come home and work on our own longitudinal study. Um, we have a, um, um, an application in right now with NHLBI and we don't have actually um, word um, of whether it'll get funded or not. But you know, Emmett, many, many years ahead of anybody else, uh, started really the first cardiovascular outcome study and it still remains the only cardiovascular outcome study um, on uh, native Hawaiians. And um, Joanne, <clears throat> Auntie Jane and many other people um, worked on that with Barbara Howard. Um, so when I see those first papers, I know, I don't know, 75% of those people, Dick Devereaux. And <laughs> yeah. I've been to, I've been to the Dakotas. I actually um, had state dinner with Lyle Best uh -huh. and slept at the farmhouse uh, <laughs> in the Dakotas and went to the Rosebud Reservation. So I um, know it very well. Actually, Barbara Howard was my mentor. It's one of the reasons why I got into research. Um, I was so impressed with her ability to be, to have a family and still continue to do research. And Jim Howard, her husband, was an endocrinologist and was one of my attendees at GW. But I want to um, ask if I can. Sorry, Vanessa and Elliot, if I'm taking so long. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask because um, our um, Pacific Oceans Native Health Legacy Study Pono Health Legacy Study, which is the name of our application in right now, that's gotten a good score, um, but it's not, we don't, we don't know about the award yet. But anyway, um, we're kind of coming at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, we're coming at it from a metabolomics, proteomics, a multiomics um, approach. And our history here in Hawaii, at least in um, in the Department of Native Hawaiian Health at the medical school, is we've actually started research with the communities by doing interventions um, because that's what they wanted. They told us that, Dr. Mao, we already know we're sick. We don't need to know how sick we are. We know we're sick. We would want something done about it. So I was wondering with this great data set you have and now the 94 families with intergenerational data, um, how you folks are um, working with uh, looking at some of the other um, proteomics and metabolomics um, questions that I'm sure are being discussed. Yeah, we... we um... The, the, we have been we have been much slower to shift to um, intervention as compared to you all, I would say. Um, and that's um, a consequence of I, I I think that just the the structure of racism and 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 the inadequate health care delivery uh, for natives on the mainland. I mean, you, you all in Hawaii are, are just leaps and bounds ahead of where we are in regards to actual health care delivery and understanding. Uh, what it means to deliver healthcare for for indigenous populations, so so we so we 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 are we are quite, we are quite behind um, you. Um, so um, I think we are still 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 kind of in in that um, uh, gathering phase. I think that there's a, just a general recognition that what we need to do is start to shift some of our um, screening and intervention to younger and younger ages. Um, I am r really in that um, in that frame of mind. I think that's why they brought me on the study as as a pediatric person, um, because you know there are even um, very early life, you know, in, in infancy um, predictors of adult disease. Um, there are even intergenerational things um, that um, are are pretty common. Um, so, for example, you know. Um, we as pediatricians know that uh, babies that are born of diabetic mothers are 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 have a larger body size. Um, they have macrosomia when they're born, and this is because they 
um, see the maternal circulating insulin as growth as growth factor. There's insulin-like growth factor receptors, and this in turn um, causes the baby to have overnutrition by the time they're um, out of their infancy. So again, it's this generational embodiment of of the racism that has been um, affected on all of our communities by colonization. So. So yeah, I think we I think that we have um, a lot to learn from you, Dr. Mao, in regards to um, application of these findings to our um, to our communities to actually not only stabilize what we're the amount of disease that we're seeing, but start to um, start to prevent it in a more meaningful way. Um, we we definitely are not there. Um, we are oh, we are we are fair at applying. Uh, best practices for treatment um, of a disease before it happens. So again, I did present that paper that showed that um, cardiovascular disease mortality um, and, and incidences mm -hmm. is at least stable, slightly um, decreasing for, from some of those measures. But at the same time, our, our prevalence of obesity and diabetes on the mainland um, is in is increasing. So, and again, I, I don't think we're doing a very good job to be honest with you. It's shame here. Shame here. Uh, your, your mention about, um, diabetes and mothers brings to mind maybe a really interesting collaboration. We have, um, an OBGYN department that's really super interested in looking at, um, stopping the intergenerational, risk for diabetes that happens over and over and over again. And here in Hawaii, actually, it's our Filipino mm -hmm. um, mothers that actually have uh, twice as much risk. One in six Filipino pregnant women has gestational diabetes mm -hmm. already. And it's uh, really, really horrible. And, and so if um, anyone out there, <laughs> Vanessa or Elliot, if you folks are interested in, in helping us with a study to stop the intergenerational, because you, like you say, Jason, you have to get younger and younger and younger and younger. Pretty soon your <laughs> preconception, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, <laughs> you're back to the mothers um, that we, we really feel it's super important that. I think because uh, Arizona, you guys have been in Arizona, they've been examining uh, to Oho Odom um, tribal members since they were the age of five, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's yeah. a big community there. So, yeah. So, um, you guys will be way ahead of us, you know, in terms of finding the longitudinal um, participants to do that. But it's it's so tragic. Um, mm -hmm. um, a lot of things about women in health are tra tragic now, but um, this is added on to all that, how, how we can stop this intergenerational thing of uh, diabetes. Yeah, um, there, there, there's also a lot, of, a lot of opportunity, I would say, especially for indigenous communities, because if mm -hmm. we if we go back to some of the teachings from our elders about traditional foods, about mm -hmm. the importance of community, about the importance of family units and friends, about the importance of breastfeeding. I mean, we what we know is that is that the, the, those those sorts of things not only combat uh, maternal cardiovascular risk that's that's um, that's related to their offspring, but you know, a breastfed baby. If you look at some of the data coming out of Montana State University, a breastfed native baby who's breastfed for more than three months has a greatly decreased risk of having obesity and metabolic syndrome by the time they're a teenager. So, so, you know, th th these, the, these things mm -hmm. are not, these things are not foreign to us as indigenous people. It's just, you know, they've just been buried a little bit from uh, colonization. So I think, you know, there's, a, there's a, there's, there are lessons that we can, that we can um, apply that we learned from our elders. Um, that's um, that we need to, um, that needs to gain regain importance and 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 would would be good uh, research projects for up and coming researchers. Yeah, I agree. So I I don't want to occupy all the time. No, I no. have a, ten other questions, but I will <laughs> stop here. <laughs> it's, it's good to hear from you again. Well, and we'll yeah, we'll get we'll get Ray Ray to Pry Doc. Okay. Awesome. Year, so. <laughs> Okay, mahalo, Dr. Mao. We we love your questions. 
So uh, from the registration form, actually, there were a couple questions about like the governance of the Strong Heart study. So people were kind of asking how you were able to involve tribal leadership and was it designed that way, like from the get go or um, and how it evolved over time, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, the so so the funders, the the is the um, federal government, NIH. Um, but the 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 original PIs really understood the importance of partnering with tribal communities. None of the original PIs were actually native. Um, there has only been three native PIs associated with Strongheart. So it really was something that um, was put in place by the non-native original PIs of Strongheart way back when it started, such as Dr. Howard. Um, such as Dick Devereaux. Um, so yeah, th th these th these things were important to them because th they were learning at the same time. Um, and um, it really has grown out of that. I mean, what, 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 um, as, as you all know, um, all indigenous communities in this, in the United States have been subjected to a harmful research, harmful um, uh, biospecimen collection, and there's 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 a there's a lot for even us as native researchers and native clinicians. There's a lot of mistrust that um, is even applied towards us because we're learning in this Western kind of kind of world. So, so yeah, so so, so some of those some of those lessons were taken to heart very early on, and um, and they have been so far they've been. Um, pretty good at um, obviating some of that mistrust, but yeah, so it's, it, it's been present for for a while. Okay, uh, our next question is from the chat from Natalie Albanese. Um, it reads, Aloha, mahalo nui loa for this amazing presentation, such strong work for our indigenous communities. The risk calculators are so impressive and exciting to be able to help our communities. Is there currently being work is there currently work being done to include interventions, including lifestyle recommendations to present along with the risk calculators? Not, yeah, so I, I think the risk calculators are important because again, they're useful for, I, I would say, you know, indigenous communities because we, all of our communities have high prevalence of diabetes and all this, but, um, you know, other communities based on their social determinants. Um, I think that I think that we we have a long way to go to recommend um, to recommend um, treat treatment and lifestyle intervention. I would say um, there was the um, the uh, policy statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics focused on on obesity prevention that came out a few years ago, a few months ago, just earlier this year. Um, in reading through that, it's 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 very it's a very aggressive. Um, guideline. Um, and I would say that it ignores some of the root causes of obesity and diabetes in indigenous communities, including systemic racism and structural racism. Um, so, you know, with there, if you want to look at that document as far as, you know, how to prevent, because, because, because it seems, because it, it seems like, and this has been borne out in strong heart, that obesity is the is the primary driving force of all of this, and it's obesity in in very young children, and maybe for the next webinar we we uh, Dr. Moki and I can talk about um, that and and show you the data um, how it tracks from you know pre -gest pre gestation to adults, um, but it seems like obesity is the is the is the is the is the pathologic um, start of of all of this. Um, so really, so that so that's why I mentioned that obesity document. So I mean, you can you can you can go you can go by the um, American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations in, in that regard. But really, when it comes down to it, it's 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 really the reason why that you know that our communities have differences in some of these um, the, the prevalence of these diseases, why they have um, different health outcomes is really due to due to racism. So. Um, so, so, so yes, you, there can, there can be some interventional guidelines that are kind of hand in hand. But we, what we really need is we really need more indigenous researchers who are invested in our communities and can really kind of 
um, obviate the effects of structural racism. We need more Indigenous doctors caring for Indigenous patients in, in our communities. Um, so really, that's 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 kind of that's kind of what we want to do, um, you know, as a as a kind of a structural intervention. But, um, just to add know. on to that, um, Jason, I'm not sure if the question was also asking about whether um, kind of going back to Marjorie's points about intervention work within Strong Heart. But um, I was speaking to Mandy Fretz the other day, um, who's one of the who's a PI at the Dakotas. And she mentioned that a priority of the Dakota's communities um, is nutrition. And so they focused a lot um, and they're currently fo focusing a lot on diet. So she mentioned that through the Strong Heart Study, they have star pilot awards that can be given to um, community members and they're smaller um, amounts of funds, like maybe $30,000 or so. Um, but these are community led projects um, and right now in the Dakotas, they have um, a project focused on like gardening. I don't know the details about it. Um, and then they also have, uh, they got funding through um, separately. So outside through GUSNIP for like produce prescriptions. Um, and so I think, you know, depending on whatever the community needs are um, and what they, you know, identify as something that would be successful and helpful. Um, there are opportunities for these com smaller community-led projects for interventions. Okay, let me switch a couple. <laughs> so there's a couple in the chat, and actually, it looks like Dr. Lum. This one is like for me and Elliot. Technically, <laughs> it says if not done so already, could you please share about your work with Dr. Lutley on this and what was his vision? Um, so Elliot, <laughs> and then of course, if doctors, Dean and Mulkey have anything to add to, because <laughs> I think we were all had like those meetings, right? Um, those Wednesday mornings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we would have um, month around month, monthly to almost bi-weekly um, Wednesday mornings. Uh, meetings where we would kind of just uh, discuss um, of course the later half it was more um, planning for this webinar but um, with Dr. Lulu we were trying to kind of bridge his Molokai heart study and kind of look at cardiovascular disease in Native Hawaiians and kind of bridge that data and compare uh, uh, his Molokai heart study with the uh, strong heart study um, looking in um, American Indians as well and so um, unfortunately we didn't get to um, do much of that yet um, due to uh, Dr. Lee's passing. However, um, after Vanessa and I completes that, we're gonna be going back and looking and brainstorming together and find a common uh, theme that we would like to base our project on um, to honor uh, Dr. Lee and his um, vision of looking uh, at both Native Hawaiian and American Indian data of cardiovascular health. Yeah, like Mahal um, Elliot. So basically just kind of going off what he was saying to Dr. Luli, you know, recognize that um, the Native Hawaiian community could benefit from like a similar framework from Dr. Dean and Dr. Mokiao's, you know, work with Strong Heart. And he recognized that at Pride Dog, and that's actually when we had our first meeting with Dr. Mm -hmm. Dean and actually Joanne too. Me and Elliot were in the hotel room uh, <laughs> at the Prada conference and we had that meeting. So yeah, um, and you know, Dr. Dean and Dr. Mogil and Joanne have been very, you know, gracious and helpful and patient with us too. Um, as we study for our step exam right now, um, they have offered their time and resources to help us to figure out what this project will um, eventually be in the future too. Yeah, I think Dr. Louis' shoes are impossible to fill, but we can still walk um the path he walked so we are we are going to do that i just want to this is marjorie i just want to say that um you know emmett was really ahead of his time in terms of thinking about um 
um, it you know on a populational level, as opposed to the thousands of patients that he cared for on Molokai. And I think um, that's why when we had an opportunity for him to do the cardiovascular outcome piece of the cardiovascular risk clinics that he started even before I came home in the 80s. Um, and that study was called Hula Kanaval Calico. Um, and it um, is, as I mentioned, one of the, it, it is the only cardiovascular outcome study, the largest. And um, Emmett had this knack for working with all kinds of people and across time zones and um, with all these uh, big wigs from NHLBI and Department of Health and Human Services. And um, I, Joanne probably knows more of all the um, people that he uh, spoke with, talked with, discussed with this, this issue of heart disease. Um, in the Hua kind of Alcalico study, it was clearly shown that diabetes um, is one of the biggest risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And in fact, most of the cardiovascular outcomes from his uh, Molokai um, population. So first of all, the number of cardiovascular events were lower than what we expected, which to Dr. Howard, to Barbara Howard was a little surprising but of the cardiovascular mortality rates, they were highest in people with diabetes. And that was statistically significant. And his Emmett's paper <clears throat> that he's the first author on is uh, not cited often enough. I think every chance I get, I try to make sure that it's um, <laughs> mentioned. And Barbara Howard's name, as many of the papers on the Strong Heart Study, and some of the more recent ones are still there. And Barbara Howard actually helped us with the Pono Health Legacy Study. So when that RFA came out, I immediately called Barbara, who was on her way to visit her grandchildren in <laughs> New Jersey. So <clears throat> anyway, we're very close friends. And so she was telling me all the things that I said, Barbara, I don't want to know how well the Strong Heart Study is doing today. I want to know all the struggles you had to go through in the very beginning because that's where we are in Hawaii, trying to create a um, cardiometabolic uh, cohort that doesn't exist right now for Native Hawaiians. It, it exists for um, cancer, but it doesn't exist for um, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. Um, so this would be, um, being that you'll be a nephrologist, Rhea, sorry, just keep trying to pull you back <laughs> into Hawaii um hopefully by then we'll have something because I'm I'm not going to be around to benefit from I'm I'm the PI of this Pono Health Legacy Study but I won't be around to benefit from uh setting it up the proper way so I think uh, we really appreciate you sharing um um the information today um but I remember Barbara Howard talking to me about I mean, all those people actually were at GW. David mm -hmm. Robbins, um, yeah, Bob Ratner, um, yeah, all those people. Um, who's the other guy? Jason Umans, mm -hmm. um, another Jason. Um, yeah, I I guess I'm getting old when I when I say I I know all the originals. <laughs> PI. <laughs> oh my God! I better shut up. Okay, sorry. Anyway, Elliot and Vanessa, if there's anything I can add that Joanne can't tell you, and I know Joanne can tell you a lot, um, please don't hesitate. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Mao. Um, our next uh, question comes from Dr. Rivera, and uh, she was wondering, was just wondering out of curiosity, what age are you starting to see um, left ventricular hypertrophy? Um, so yeah, so it's very, very, very good to, oh my goodness. I haven't, I haven't thought about you in a long time. We, we were med students together. So, um, so, um, er, early, I would say, I mean, the strong heart family study does have, um, echocardiographic, um, cardiac geometry measurements and, and, and th there's increased heart thickness, uh, even as, as young as 14. 
So obviously if there's already, if there's already, um, you know, uh, that phenotype at 14, it, it, mu it must be present in, in, in some stage at earlier, at earlier ages. So, um, so yeah, so the data we have is 14, but it's, 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 it's probably much earlier. So. You know, Jason, I was curious about one of your slides. It it surprised me to see that the highest ejection fraction was sixty one percent. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, you I went mean, through that, those that slides was, pretty quickly, but yeah. I was just like sixty one percent. Holy Toledo! Yeah, that's definitely yeah. lo lowish normal. Yeah, it's it's it that that is that is surprising. Um, and the and the air bars were quite tight, so yeah, that is that is a little surprising. Um. But, you know, it, it, it may stem from, you know, you know, what what is normal for, you know, we consider 55 percent or or higher normal um, are those data from pri primary Caucasian populations and, you know, our indigenous um, ejection fractions a little different. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. So. Yeah. And well, I was thinking that it might also suggest that there's more diastolic dysfunction, yeah. which isn't measured in the ejection fraction. Um, so I, I don't know. There's so many questions. Yeah. I mean, chop, chop, a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It looks like we're nearing the 630 time mark. So if there um, isn't any more questions in the Q and A chat, I'll hand it back over to Joanne then. Mahalo to uh, Vanessa and Elliot. Thank you so much. Yes, I forgot. I said monthly calls, but it was actually bi-weekly and some months weekly because Emmett was so excited to have met with you, Jason. He really was. And then get introduced to Rhea and nothing made him happier than also including students. So, you know, he, I kept saying, it's not a month yet, Emmett. Then he goes, oh no, well, how about next week? I have something to talk about. So I'm so glad we had his time and we had his mana on. And um, I think it's clear that this was on his mind so long ago and created so many good models. You know, he cast the net wide all the time, talked to a million people, and thank goodness he got to talk with uh, the two of you. And I'm so encouraged because I hear a lot of inklings about people wanting to talk with you more. So definitely we'll get you on the shores. I know, Rhea, you're coming sooner, so we'll work on that. Jason, we're definitely going to get you over here. Uh, I want to thank everybody and all the sponsors, especially the Ahahui on And um, if you have further questions, uh, you have emails for both Dr. Dean and Dr. Mokiao. Uh, people will be getting a link to a survey just to let us know what you thought about the session and what we could do to improve. Or um, And... Thank you, Jason, for saying maybe in the next session, because that just gave me a charge because I know Emmett would have given it to me. So, hey, we're on for that. And thank you, everybody. Um, and mahalo to our Alma Kua, now Emmett. And uh, everybody have a good evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>